Hello and welcome to the Money Marketing Podcast. I'm Kimberly Dondo, Digital Content Manager. And in this week's Weekend Essay podcast, we have reporter Jean-Baptiste Andreu asking, when does it become interesting to take a new client on board? Take it away, JB. I sometimes listen to football talk shows on French radio stations in a regular critique that most football journalists have never been professional footballers themselves. I'm sure that this critique also exists in the UK. I must confess that I hardly consume non-financial UK media and have for this reason very little knowledge of the everyday culture of my host country. Football and financial advice do not have much in common, but this is also a critique of journalists and trade publications. I do understand this reproach. Most of us, including myself, have never sat in front of a client. We may not get everything right, but I think we still bring an external view on the profession. Feedback on our articles from advisors can be harsh, but I never take them badly. In fact, I think it helps me to understand issues more from the perspective. I try to picture what it's like to be an advisor. A simple solution would be to shadow an advisor for a few days, but for now, I have to use my imagination. A recent weekend essay by my colleague Michael Climes tackled, among other things, the advice gap and the fact advisor usually seem to go for clients with significant assets in the management. There are a lot of debates around the advice gap and the way advisors select their clients. For some, financial advice is solely a business, to others it is more altruistic. There is also disagreement on this question within the editorial team at Money Marketing. We are not a monolite. Michael's weekend essay made me wonder how I would pick up my clients if I were an advisor. I do agree that a lot of people in this country could do with some financial advice. While we are not a consumer publication, I get the chance to speak with people who have difficulty navigating their finances. They may have been trapped into shady investments, transfer the pension to other schemes when they shouldn't have, etc. That being said, I also agree with the argument that financial advice is a business. Advisors do not work for free. Their only duty is to help the clients achieve their financial goals. And since recently, at fair value, nothing more, nothing less. They are neither charities nor a public service. If I were an advisor, I would maybe help where I could and do some pro bono work, depending on how busy I am. But my primary goal would remain to make a profit. (coughs) Becoming an advisor is difficult. You have to obtain a range of qualifications that are not easily acquired. Quite often, advisors are also entrepreneurs. The bulk of the UK financial advice industry is made of SMEs and one-person firms. It takes a lot of time, risk and personal sacrifice. You do not go through all of that effort to earn peanuts in the end. I can perfectly understand why a lot of advisors target clients with attractive AUM. I would not do things any differently. To my understanding, AUM is more relevant if you're charging ongoing fees rather than flat fees, but a potential client still has to be able to afford to pay these flat fees. Now, I do wonder what fair value in the context of a new consumer duty means. Personally, I do not find it very clear. It might prevent, prevent firms from extorting clients, but I doubt fees will become affordable for the average person. The only scenario where I could see that happening is if the advice offers starts to to exceed the the demand. We are very far from that, and considering the difficulties and technicality involved in becoming a regulated advisor, I doubt it will change. The question that should be posed is, if financial advice was not financially rewarding, how many would leave the profession? By the same token, How would it impact the number of people considering embracing a career in financial advice? I know that there are some advisors out there who would not like what they've just read. In fact, Lamb Financial Director David Lamb will probably strongly disagree with my point of view. He says, I'm really against having minimum amounts for stats in the management or income when accepting new clients. The aim of our service is to help our clients achieve the desired lifestyle using the assets they have available. It's not about the money. Achieving this aim usually involves the accumulation of assets at some point, and quite often we have to coach clients to give them the confidence to spend their wealth. 
Having a minimum of AUM is almost a conflict of interest. This is a concern when I hear wealth managers bragging about how much AUM they have. It's not good for the client. Some people are more money driven than others who would have other criteria. Lem mentions the client's story, aims, and objective as important criteria. He would also take into consideration whether he wants this person in his life over the next however many years. It also seems to be the case for West Riding Personal Finance Solution Managing Director Neil Levesage, who says, What's important is that their values align with ours, that they are happy to pay our extremely reasonable fees, and they are polite to my staff. <laughs> I would not have thought about it by, by myself, but I think this is an important consideration. I did a range of customer facing job in the past. I'm well positioned to know how annoying and entitled some clients can be. Since advisors have the luxury of choice when it comes to picking their clients and the decision can be based on different criteria, such things depend much on personality and preferences. There are regu regularly calls for the advice industry to approach younger clients. I also blew my trumpet on this issue in my very first weekend essay at Money Marketing. In hindsight, I think this would not make sense, or at least not for every advisor. The average UK advisor is in their 50s or 60s. As such, there is no financial incentive for them to think too far ahead if the aim is to shut or sell the business in 10 years. <coughs> for younger advisors or older advisors, hoping that the business will outlive them, I think now is a good time to start poaching millennial clients. Considering my age, I think if I were an advisor, that would be in my interest to do so. I would see it as a long-term investment. They might not have the same amount of wealth as people, as people in the decumulation phase right now, but this day will eventually come. Continuum Managing Partner Martin Brown says, Clients that some advice firms may determine to not be profitable enough for their attention today can become the profitable clients of the future. By the time that these clients meet the, the arbitrary threshold some advice firms put in place, it could be too late. The potential clients may have turned elsewhere for advice or have been discouraged away from regulated advice completely due to not having been seen as important enough to warrant attention. To summarize, wealth, values and potential would be three factors I would look at when considering taking new client on board. Again, this is my view as a non-practitioner practitioner after a year and a few months covering the financial advice market. I'm sure that some readers will have found my musings abhorrent, but rest assured, I have no intention of becoming a financial advisor. Thanks, JB, for another great weekend essay podcast. We do hope that you enjoyed it. Please do keep up to date with all our new releases via Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you get your podcasts from. You can also keep up to date with all new content published on the Money Marketing website, as well as our print edition, Money Marketing Magazine. So make sure to subscribe. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. See you next time.